Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to 6S0A3, 18S191, Computational Thinking with Julia in spring 2021. So today we're going to, so we're in the probability module, probability, statistics, data science. Today we're going to look at how we can use probability to make a model of a um, process of something that is changing in time. <clears throat> and so in, uh, basically what we want to simulate is a sort of the simplest model where we have individual objects that do something and they do something as time goes on. And so what we're going to look at is a model for failure of mechanical components or failure of light bulbs. So we have light bulbs that are on and then they're going to switch off at some time and we want to model that process. So um, some pieces of Julia that we're going to see today are how we can take a function that is in some package, which is not base and extend that. So how we can define new methods on that function that operate on new types that we define. We've already seen how to do that with uh, functions from base Julia, which is this sort of uh, basic, basic library that Julia always provides. And now we're going to see how to do that from another package, which actually looks just the same. And uh, so we're also going to think again about why we would actually want to create a new type at all. What does that actually model in the system? Uh, and sort of two little details, we'll see how we can plot shapes with Julia and um, something about string interpolation. Okay, so what are we gonna do? Let's just jump straight in and visualize the system. So here we have some number of light bulbs and green is going to mean that the light bulbs are working correctly. And then um, at every time step, each light bulb is going to fail with some probability. And so right now that probability is, uh, so I can change that probability with the slider P is right now is 0 0.1. So at each time step, each light bulb, you know, sort of has some internal components, uh, you know, a filament in the case of old fashioned light bulbs. And uh, that has a probability that on each day, let's say, that will actually fail. And then the light bulb, light, bulb, light bulb will turn off. And so what that looks like is this, and when I move to the next time step, um, you see that these three light bulbs are about to fail. And so we color them in red and we're label, labeling them with the time at which they actually fail. So we start at time zero and at time one, which is sort of on day one, basically, we look which light bulbs have failed. And so, you know, if you, you put up sort of decorations, lights, uh, lights in these long chains that people use, for example, at Christmas, uh, then you worry about when these light bulbs will fail. Okay, so uh, at the next time step, the ones that failed at the previous time step will now color in purple. That means they're actually sort of dead. They actually don't work anymore. And at that same time step, some more get colored in red because those are failing at this step. And so again, we, we label uh, the ones that have just failed. And so we'll, we'll carry on doing that. As time goes on, we'll just get, um, sorry, I went backwards instead of forwards. We'll go forwards in time and more and more light bulbs will fail until, you know, uh, let's jump ahead a bit. We see that in this particular simulation, um, we have to wait a certain amount of time and oh, these, these few are still alive. When does the last one actually die? And it turned out that it died at time 38. And so one, when you see these, this data, you know, this is an example of a computational thinking experiment. We're just sort of running the simulation in some way that we'll, we'll discuss how to actually run the simulation. But if, if you see this, this happening, or you, you know, if you saw this in an actual array of light bulbs, you would start to ask yourself questions such as, you know, if I fix my attention on one particular light bulb, how long might I expect that light bulb to stay alive? Or you could ask at time T, how many light bulbs do I expect to fail at that moment? Uh, and so you can, you know, you can start just um, immediately asking these kind of questions. <clears throat> and there are some more questions that we can, can ask as well, uh, which is, well, another sort of more difficult question, which is, well, light bulbs do not actually fail, you know, just sort of once a day. It's not that they have a clock that says, oh yeah, at this time on this day, you decide whether you fail or not. So what would be a more realistic model where 
actually a light bulb can actually fail at any moment of, in, in time. How could, we, how could we model that as well? Okay, so hopefully um, if you think about it, you know, using some of the techniques we've already seen, you can, you can see how we could actually run the simulation. So you know, uh, we just sort of loop through all of these light bulbs at each time step, we loop through the light bulbs and, we, and each one is going to decide, do I fail with probability 0 0.1 or do I succeed with probability uh, do, I, do I stay alive basically with probability one minus 0 0.1 or 0 0.9? Okay, so that's, um, that's what we need to model. So how can we actually do that simulation? So, so here's the kind of function that we're going to write. And basically the important part is that we need to have some store, some information. So, so this, this is a, just a picture, you know, a nice image of the array that we're storing data into. And so this is literally a matrix in this case, it is, that's just because of the visual representation It's really just a collection of light bulbs. There's no, there's, you know, there's no information in the way that they're actually arranged in space. In this particular case, you could imagine a case where, there were, where that mattered, where you know, whether one light bulb failed depended on the neighbors. That's not the case here. All of the light bulbs are totally independent. You know, the, what happens in the neighboring light bulb does not affect what happens in uh, this particular light bulb. And so we're, we're storing in this, this, this uh, matrix V starts off at all zeros. So zero means that the light bulb is still alive. And then when the light bulb dies at that moment, we will store the current time uh, as you saw in, in the labels on that array. And so, you know, um, hopefully you can write that function. So basically, um, so if, you know, we have, we generate our random number as usual with probability P, just like we did last time um, using this, just generate a uniform random number between zero and one with this rand parentheses with nothing inside that, that's what that does. And we check if that is less than P, this probability of interest. And if that event occurs and currently it's in the zero state, that means that it's still alive, then we set that, that value to T, the current time. And we're just updating T each time through this while loop. So that is, um, that is the very simple dynamics of this model, right? So what do I mean by dynamics? I mean something that is changing in time. So you know, we have literally time advancing and as time advances, things happen and the light bulbs to each of the states of each light bulb changes possibly with this probability. So this is actually what we call a stochastic process. So basically process just is another word, yet another word for evolution in time or dynamics. You know, is something is processing, it's moving in time. And stochastic is just another word for probability or probabilistic. So it's a literally a process that is changing in time using some probabil probabilistic elements. Okay, and these kinds of models are super common in all kinds of branches of science, you know, engineering, economics, finance, uh, sociology, et cetera. Uh, this is one of the most common models in a way, and biology. This is uh, one of the most common models, common types of models uh, together with say differential equations. And we'll actually make the link between those two types of models. You can often relate those two models. So, you know, for example, you could think of a system of a chemical reaction where you have, so you can think of a chemical reaction. You could think of that as the, at the level of, I'm looking at a beaker with chemicals in from a long way away. And what I want to know is what is the total concentration of the chemical, you know, number chemical called A and the chemical called B or the species A and species B inside this beaker of, of chemicals and how do they change in time? That's what we could call a macroscopic picture of the, of the um, system. But we can also sort of zoom in and look at the individual molecules of type A and the individual molecules of type B, which are moving around in space. And when they meet, they might interact and they might react with some probability and change into you know, type C, for example. And so we have these sort of duality between whether you want to do this microscopic or uh, description where you model each molecule moving around. That's what we're calling an individual based model or an agent based model. But you, but you might want to model it at the level of the total system and just look at the total number of molecules in each state, which is a macroscopic model. And we actually want to relate those two, which is sort of the goal of statistical, statistical mechanics. 
which is actually what we're going to do here in this very simple model, right? So this is the sort of simplest possible stochastic process because each individual is totally independent of all the other ones. And it just has two possible states on and off. And it just is changing in time in this very simple way. Okay, hopefully it's clear what the model is and how we can actually simulate it. So uh, yeah, just to comment, so how do we draw these nice circles on these squares in Julia? So um, <clears throat> what you need to do is actually, you know, if you think about how plots works, the plots.jl package, or may actually most plotting packages, what you would need to specify are the coordinates of the points that you want to draw, the points that you want to join. And in plots.jl, usually what you do is specify the X coordinates of the points in one collection, in one vector, and the Y coordinates of the same points in a separate vector. There, there are other ways to do it, but that's a common way to do it. And so what we want to do, for example, for a square we, or a rectangle, we just need four coordinates. So we would have a list, a vector of four X coordinates and a vector of four Y coordinates. For a circle, we would actually have to generate all of these points around the circle, generate their X coordinates and their Y coordinates. And that's not so obvious how to do that. But if you think about it, that's exactly what trigonometry uh, tells us how to do with cosines and sines. So the X coordinate around a circle is going to be the radius times cosine of theta, the angle, and the Y coordinate will be R times sine of theta. So that's what we've just made two little functions here. I think there are similar functions already defined in plots .jl, but it's easy enough to make your own function. So let's make a rectangle with width W, height H, and located at position X comma Y. So you could either think of x comma y as being the center of the rectangle or one corner of the rectangle. And here we're actually, we chose to do one corner of the rectangle. And so, you know, we, we have, the, these are the x coordinates, whichever x you started with plus zero, w, w or zero as you move around in order, of course it has to be ordered, the four coordinates of the rectangle. And here are the same for the y coordinates, just um, adding them in a slightly different order as you move around this square. And similarly for a circle with radius r now centered at x and y, uh, we're gonna take theta as the range from zero to two pi. Uh, so, well, we're using this lin range function, but uh, these days you, you would just write range of zero to two pi with length 30. And then um, length equals 30. That's actually necessary to write length equals there, a keyword argument. And then, uh, so we're going to take x dot plus r dot times cosine dot of theta. So we're taking, you know, each theta in this vector of thetas, or this, not a vector, it's a, well, it's an abstract vector, a range. And then we're taking cosine of that, multiplying it by r, and adding the x, and similarly for y. Okay, so that's, uh, so then those generate the x and y coordinates of these shapes. And then how do we get the actual filled in shapes? It's very easy. We just put fill equals true. And for example, I could, um, as a keyword argument, when I plot the object, right? So here I'm just plotting this rectangle object. Um, so, uh, this rectangle object gives me back the two vectors, the X and Y vectors, and that's what you pass into this plot command. And then similarly for the circle, that gives me back the X and Y vectors for the circle at you know, wherever um, it is. And then to get these labels, these numbers, uh, I actually use this annotate bang function in plots. And uh, so there I specify the X coordinate and the Y coordinate, and then the text that I want to write. And so here I'm interpolating. So this is string interpolation that I was mentioning. So I don't think we've explicitly mentioned that before. So basically you have a string with double quotes and how do you interpolate? What does that even mean? It means I want to put inside that string. So this annotation needs a string, but I want to put something inside the string, which is the value of this variable, the ijth coordinate of this, of this variable, this matrix called simulation. And so I do dollars. That is this in, it, a sort of operator, which puts in the value of this string, uh, of this variable, sorry, inside the string and dollars with parentheses, uh, whatever is inside the parentheses is just Julia code that it will be executed. And the result of that code 
will actually be put inside this frame. And then I can specify the font size. I don't even need the word font there. I just put the size seven and um, I, I give a color and that will um, annotate those labels. So for example, if I change this to green, it will, it will give me green labels, et cetera. And finally, I can put fill equals true, but I can, uh, and this alpha equals 0 0.5 is not actually doing anything there. So I need fill alpha, and then I get a sort of transparent fill here in the, um, I should do anyway, no, I didn't. Okay, not, not sure what's going on there. I thought that should have worked. Oh, I did the wrong one, sorry. Uh, this is the, the circle, fill alpha equals true, should give me a sort of, a, a, Okay, that's not what I was expecting either. So maybe it is just alpha then. Alpha equals 0 0.5 gives me a sort of uh, transparent fill. Okay, so that's a pretty useful uh, thing for to, to draw nice plots. Okay, so you can see that, you know, um, if you're thinking of wanting to draw an, a figure, um, Oh, uh, yeah, somebody is asking uh, when trying to open a JL file, the simple simulation.jl could not be loaded. Please report this error. I'm not actually sure what that is about, but that's actually the wrong, uh, the wrong notebook. We're not using simple simulation, we're using simulating component failure. Hopefully that one will work. Okay, so yeah, what I was saying was uh, when you want to you know, draw a figure for, you know, a, I don't know, some, a paper or a, a, you know, a, what do you call it, an essay that you're writing for a class, you might think of going to a tool like Illustrator or Inkscape uh, where you sort of man, or even PowerPoint where you manually draw you know, lines and disks and things and you can sort of manually resize them. But this is now giving us a pretty powerful tool where we can programmatically sort of specify exactly the coordinates of uh, the objects that we want to place and how we want to place them on which color. And we have much more control. You can do loops much more easily because we have an actual programming language, right? So of course, it's always quicker quicker and easier to, to drag a few, few circles if there's just a few of them. But if you want to do something like this, you know, it will look worse in PowerPoint actually because you, it, it will be harder to line everything up properly, et cetera. Okay, that's a challenge for PowerPoint experts to make it look nice. Okay, so now what, what, what do we want to do? So the first thing we might think of doing is just let's count up the number of these things that are green, red, and purple at each time step. Just a minute. Excuse me. So let's just count them up, right? So we have three different colors, so we want three different plots. So here are those plots. So how can we get those? We just literally count, you know, the number that, so it's, it's slightly difficult because the, uh, the data that we're storing, uh, we're just storing this final number when they finally turn purple. And so we have to distinguish the, the different colors by sort of what information is stored in this matrix. So you can think about how to do that. And then, you know, the answer is sort of in the code or an answer, a way of doing it. Or you could store different information. For example, you could store separately each copy of the matrix as time goes on. You could store all of those matrices in an array and that might actually make it easier to, to calculate. Or you could actually, as you do the simulation, you could store the information about the total numbers of uh, each type you know, in some variables as you go along. So there are lots of ways of doing it. They're, they're all kind of right and they're all maybe easier or harder in different circumstances. Anyway, so let's plot the numbers of each of these things. So first of all, let's plot the number of purples as time goes on. And I'm just going to add you know, uh, more time there. And um, so there we go. So this is time on the horizontal axis. So by time 27, you know, we see that, uh, so there's a hundred, it's, it's, uh, let's just make it 10 by 10 uh, to make it easier to, Remember that there are now going to be at 100 of these uh, things, light bulbs. There we go. And so, out of those 100 by time 27, we can see that most of them have already failed. 
And then here's the green on top of that same curve. Here's the, the greens, which are the number which are still alive, right? So we start with 100 alive, and we see that this is exactly complementary to the number that have failed, of course. So, um, and then the number which at each time step are uh, failing, let's say, is this, this curve here. And so you can see that these curves are actually look quite nice and smooth, whereas this curve looks pretty uh, noisy. So why is that? It's basically because this curve is sort of the, this data is basically some kind of difference of this data here, or this data here is basically the integral or the, the cumulative sums of, of this data. And that operation taking the integral or the cumulative sum smooths out noise in the data. Right? So how can I get better data? Well, I could either take a bigger system or I could actually average over different simulations. So you can see that this is really, you know, I really have time moving on and I have some process going on. It's random or stochastic or probabilistic. And so this is sort of the picture of what a, a an example of a stochastic process looks like. Okay. So I already talked about string interpolation. Here's a nice um, cute example. So here is, at this link uh, is a an image of Daniel Bernoulli. So we are using Bernoulli random variables, which I'll talk about again in a minute. And uh, so we're just grabbing his picture from Wikipedia or Wikimedia. And then that's at this URL, right? So it's an unfortunately long URL, but it's just it's just the address. You know, if I paste that into Chrome, it'll just show me that image as a JPEG. Now what I want to do is actually use that image in Pluto and be able to resize it interactively with this slider called Bernoulli width. And so you can see that when I slide this, here is the picture of Bernoulli. And as I slide it, the picture is actually changing size. That's the kind of cool effect that you can do with Pluto. So how are we doing that? So what we, what we need to do is actually use an HTML command. So this string here is actually HTML code. And it turns out that you write this sort of less than, and then there's this IMG for image tag, and you need to close the tag over here. And so I, I, it, it's, it's similar to keyword arguments in Julia. So you, you write the name of sort of the keyword argument effectively. So here we have SRC, which means source. So where is the source of my image? It's, it's this URL. But that URL is a Julia string. And now I'm making another Julia string. So how am I going to put that value of that URL into this string? I just interpolate it with dollars, just like I was just saying. I really then, love this dynamic HTML. It's pretty fun. Yeah, great. I, I can only imagine a lot of other fun things you might be able to do with that. Yeah. It well, I'll, the I'll have a competition for the fun, most fun uh, HTML uh, tricks that you can do in, in Pluto. So, and then you have another uh, argument, which is width equals, and then we want to substitute in the value of this variable called Bernoulli width, which is a number now, right? So here I'm substituting a string into a string. Here I'm substituting a number into a string. It works just the same. And I get this new string. And you can see if I just scroll along this new script, string, that the current value of the width here, 250, has been interpolated correctly into this string. And indeed, the URL, this whole long thing, has also been interpolated. And then finally, I just convert that all to an HTML object with this HTML constructor. So there's also the other thing you can do is something like this. Um, here's a strange piece of HTML that does what's called a non-breaking. No, I didn't mean that. Uh, sorry. Uh, what did I mean? Uh, yeah, so let's do uh, sort of. Mm. What was I going to do? Yeah, okay, let's do three and then break and then four. So that makes this break makes a new line there. If I, if I don't put that, I just put a space, it'll put them next to each other. If I put the break, it'll put them on a new line. And so this is a different, so I could have written this as HTML of the Julia string three break four. This is taking this Julia string and converting it into HTML. But instead of that, I'm using what's called a non standard string literal where I put the eight, this HTML just exactly juxtaposed right in front of this double quote. And that um, has the same effect as this, basically. So this is, the very, this is quite a common thing to do in Julia. You can actually define your own 
non-standard string literals that interpret the string in a different way. So here, it's interpreting the string as HTML. It's basically doing the same thing as this. Dave, how easy would it be to have a, a slider going from one to 10 and then you know, call that something um, and then, and then um, put that number of breaks into the string? Oh, great, great question. Yeah, so uh, let's bind something. I didn't literally mean something, but that's fine. Go for yeah. it. Uh, I say num breaks slider one to ten will show value equals true. So what do we need to do? We need um, lots of breaks. So that's just going to be a Julia string. So how can we do that? So you could think of you know doing with a for loop, for example. But there's actually something called repeated. If I'm not mistaken, repeat string breaks. Uh, let's say five times, there we go. That will just copy the string five times. So you could have actually done that like this, a string break to the power five that uh, actually does the same thing. Well, that's really cool. Oh. Yeah. So why does that do the same thing? Because in Julia, the way you do string concatenation is times. So in other languages you use plus, in Julia you use times and the reason that it's not plus is because plus is usually reserved for operations that are commutative. Uh, that means that you can do them either way around, right? So A plus B should be the same as B plus A, but that's not the case with strings. And so we use times instead um, because, you know, if you multiply two matrices, for example, uh, the order can often matters. So times is often a non-commutative operation, whereas plus is always commutative. That's the, that's the logic. You can argue whether that's, a, you know, sensible or not. Okay, and so, well, if we're using times to concatenate two things, then how do you concatenate five things? You, you write times five times. And so that's like writing a power. And so that's where this logic comes from. So, so let's see it work. Yeah, so then what do I want to do? I want to take my string, which is three, and then I want to substitute in this sort of break to the power five. Right, so that's just a piece of Julia code. So I just put it inside these parentheses and then four, and then we get a nice big space. But I want, I want num breaks. You want what? Oh, number breaks. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. So, uh, to the power of numbers. So as I change num num breaks, the, the the width changes. Yeah. Nice example. I just think that there's so many fun things one could do. Yep. Just now to limit the imagination to. Yeah. I mean, I usually think of HTML as kind of static, right? And now all of a sudden it's becoming alive. Right, so HTML in some sense is static, but once you mix JavaScript into the mix, you're actually able to script HTML and make it dynamic. And that's what JavaScript does. You mix JavaScript and you got Pluto and Julia. Right, so Pluto and Julia are using JavaScript to do this, right? That's the point. But, but it's hidden from you. It's sort of a nice interface to be able to use JavaScript in, a, in, a, in clever ways. Okay. So let's get back to the main story. So we have these light bulbs that are fading. So what is the math behind that? It's these Bernoulli random variables that we started talking about last time. So let's remember that a Bernoulli random variable, what does that mean? It, it, it models a weighted coin. So it takes the value one with probability P, that's one or heads with probability P and zero with probability Q, uh, which is one minus P, so that's often called Q. And so the total probability is one uh, as it has to be for any probability. And we defined this function, if I remember correctly, I think we defined that before. Bernoulli of P equals rand less than P. So this is you know, true if this random number between zero and one uniform uh, is less than P, that happens with probability P. And so that is generating an event true, it generates the value true with probability P. So you know, if I just run it with, with 0 0.25 and I run it uh, several times, on average, I should expect to get true once every four times on average. But of course, it might not happen that you get it every four times. It might take 20, 20, 20 throws before, before you actually get a true. And then uh, down here, I've just taken, you know, 100 flips of this weighted coin and converting them to int. Uh, so I get a zero or a one out. Okay. So what can we ask about this so what, what, again, what is a random variable? It's this sort of, you know, conceptually from a computational, computational thinking point of view, it's an object, it's a something which 
every time you run a simulation, you sort of look at the value of this object that, that, that comes out of the simulation and it, and it takes different values on. Those values occur with some frequencies and the uh, frequencies are the probabilities that we're talking about. So what does it mean to take value one with probability P? It means in this uh, limit where we take a large, huge number of trials, uh, approximately a fraction P of them, a proportion P of them will be true. And so what can we ask? So if we have this kind of sequence of, of, of results, we can ask, for example, what is the mean value that we get? So this is just some data now. We're just thinking of this as some data that we sampled, or you know, somebody gave me this data from an experiment that they did in, on a real system. You could just say, well, I'm just gonna do some data analysis on this. What could I, what's the first thing I, I do? I calculate the mean, the average. So what's the average value of this? Well, if you think about it, you know, you're just gonna sum, sum up all of these values and then divide by the number of them. And so that should actually give me approximately P again, right? So the mean should be P. And so if I literally take the mean of this data, uh, here, this data is called flips, I'm taking the mean of it, it gives me 0.24, which is approximately 0.25, which I, is the P I put in. And if I keep running this, every time I'll get a different value for the mean, as you can see down here. And so, you know, if you do this, if you think of this experiment as sort of flipping 100 coins and calculating the mean, that's actually giving you a new, a new random variable, actually. Now the random variable takes on not uh, it doesn't take on integer values, now it takes on floating point values or, or real values. And then you could ask for information about this object, for example, what is its mean and what is its standard deviation, etc. So that's an interesting question and um, we won't go into that right now, but think about that or, you know, just do an experiment. So generate some data for this new random variable and calculate its mean and its, its variance and what do you notice? What, what is its distribution? You could plot its histogram, et cetera. Okay. And then, you know, exercise calculate the variance of a Bernoulli random variable um, analytically. Okay. So, so we already saw this, but okay, let's think, what is a Bernoulli random variable? It's some kind of mathematical object that's pretty difficult to describe, actually. It's kind of abstract. It's it's difficult to get your hands on what it is. Is it, is it a function? Where does it go from? Where does it go to, et cetera? I don't see it as difficult. My big problem, just to be clear, is I never remember that Bernoulli means like a coin that's going to be 25% of the time heads. Like, like I always just forget that it's Bernoulli means that. Right. Like I almost feel like I need a little post-it next to my computer. Bernoulli of P means that a heads will come up with probability p, yeah, it could just be called coin flip, but it's just yeah. a weighted coin flip of 0.25 yeah. would mean a right. lot more than Bernoulli to me. I agree. Yeah, uh, it's just to honor, you know, honor the Bernoulli family, which was uh, crucial in founding probability in the 17th century. I don't think Jacob would care anymore. <laughs> you might be right. Okay, it's also difficult to spell. Um, okay, so anyway, so what is this? object called a Bernoulli random variable. We don't actually really care what it is mathematically, at least in this course. What we care is how do we represent it computationally? And so here what I'm doing is just having a function that is re returning a random value, right? But what if I wanted to now, uh, so we can calculate, we know what the mean of this Bernoulli random variable is analytically exactly. And so we want a way of sort of telling the user or the computer that information. So we're going to start accumulating information about, about this random, this particular random variable. For example, also its standard deviation and its, I don't know, distribution function, etc. And we want to associate all of that information with this one, with, with this one thing called a Bernoulli random variable. You've got a mean. You've got a sample mean of 0.27. Is that not the mean? That, that is, is a good point. This, I could call that a sample mean. That's a good, good, good point. Let's call that a sample mean. Uh, so sample mean of data is sum of data over length of data. Length of data. And then sample mean of this data flips. The sample mean changes each time. If I could take an infinite sized um, uh, set of data, then I would hope that this sample mean gave me what's called the population mean or the true mean 
uh, of the sort of underlying theoretical object, which is going to be exactly this value of p that I put in. Yeah, great point. Okay, so anyway, the point is I'm accumulating all this information about a, a thing called a Bernoulli random variable. So how could I actually encode that computationally? And um, we've actually already seen the answer to that. And the answer is make it into a type. So make it a new type for this object. So let's actually make an object called Bernoulli. Uh, so now maybe you would prefer to make it called weighted coin flip. But since we have to learn the word Bernoulli, let's just call it Bernoulli. So let's just put a, a remark, weighted coin flip. Uh, so we're going to have the weight, right? The probability that it comes up heads, which is P, which, is, which will be our float 64, for example. And then what else, what other information do we have about a Bernoulli random variable? The answer is we do not have any other information about it. That The entire information lives in just that one number P. Uh, the entire sort of internal information about it. And then, well, that's not quite true, but uh, what we will now want to do is actually define functions that act on this object that will give us everything else, right? So we want to be able to, for example, sample from it. In other words, run the experiment, run a Bernoulli random variable and generate a, what's called a random variate, uh, the outcome of, an ex of this experiment. And the natural, so you might think, oh, I, yeah, so we already wrote a function to do that, which was Bernoulli with a little b. So types in Julia always start with capital letters. And um, so what would be a suitable function to do that? Well, we've actually already seen a suitable function, which is the rand function we saw a couple of lectures ago. Rand samples randomly from objects, right? So here we have an object and I want to sample randomly from it. But now random sampling from that object will mean generating you know, one with probability P and zero with probability one minus P. And so, well, we actually want to define our own version of RAND, which we, I don't think we actually did before. Uh, so how do we do that? We're going to extend the RAND function. And the RAND function lives in Julia's base library, this sort of library that has all the basic uh, functions inside. And so we're literally going to write a new method, a new function definition, a new version of this base got rand function. In other words, rand that lives in the base library. And it's going to act on an object of our new type. And so we, we write that with this type annotation, colon, colon, and this Bernoulli um, type, right, that we just defined. And what does it do? It does the same thing as we did before. It just generates a random number uniformly between zero and one and checks, is that less than P? But now the P that I'm interested in is the P that belongs to this Bernoulli random variable that I'm passing in. And so I use x.p to select that value of p from inside that object. And then I'm converting it to an int. So I'm, can you, I am always confused between capital letters and small letters. You did a small Bernoulli and a big Bernoulli. And yeah, um, I mean, I've certainly looked at student homeworks and I see names sometimes with capital letters. What is the yeah. Julia convention? What, where, how do you do it? In Julia, the convention is Functions start with small letters, lowercase, and types start with uppercase. What about variable names? Functions and variable names. But, but I mean, well, you've got a capital X right on the line above. Uh, good point. I think yeah. the, I think the convention is typically. Um, that actually, um, that that one letter names or maybe small names might be capital. Right, so I put- so what's the, the ones that look like words are small letters, I think. I, right, I, I put a capital because mathematically you would often use a capital letter for a right. right. Like for a matrix, I would use a capital A or a capital M or- True, yeah. Okay, so maybe with an exception for one variable, or, you know, one letter, variable names for mathematical objects. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's let's make an object of our type. Uh, so that's using this constructor function that Julia makes automatically. So if I do methods of Bernoulli, we see that Julia automatically created two 
okay, it's a bit annoying to read, but uh, two versions of a function with the same name as the type. One of them takes in a P, which is of type float 64, and the other type types in, takes in a type, uh, so it takes in a variable P, which is of any type and tries to convert it to float 64, actually. And um, so I pass in this, this thing. So, well, so that conversion, for example, uh, could happen if I passed in the rational number one quarter, that will, it will actually be, sorry, I can't call it B, let's not call it anything, but newly of one quarter, it will convert this rational number into a float. That's what the second constructor does. Okay, so now I have my object called B, which is a Bernoulli random variable, an abstract thing, a sort of ab mathematically abstract thing. And now I want to do something to it, which is uh, I want to generate randomness from it. So I've just literally called rand of B. So we've defined a new version, a new method for this rand function, which acts on these Bernoulli random variable and it should generate, what is it supposed to do? It's supposed to generate ones with probability 0 0.25 and zeros with probability 0 0.75. So when I, when I call this again and again, I should see a, a one again, approximately one quarter or one fourth of the time. And indeed I did. So we've actually, you know, implemented RAND for a new object in a, a sensible way, which is, uh, in my opinion, pretty cool. Okay. And so um, what else can we do? We want to define the mean. Now this means the sort of true population mean uh, of a random Bernoulli random variable. And it turns out that the mean function actually lives in the statistics package, not in base. So the statistics is actually a standard library package uh, or standard library that comes with any solution installation of Julia, but you have to explicitly do using statistics in order to, to use it. So to use functions that are defined inside that package, but we already did using statistics at the very top of the notebook. So if I do it, try and do it again here, it will, it will complain, right? And it says multiple definitions for statistics that's not allowed. So I'm just going to delete this version of using statistics and just use the previous one. Okay. And now, uh, yeah, okay, there we go. So what is the mean of a Bernoulli random variable? It's just the P that belongs to that random variable. And so when I do mean of B, it actually uh, does, gives me 0 0.25. So later on, we'll define another kind of random variable. And the next lecture uh, or in a future lecture, we'll actually extend what we're doing here in an um, interesting way. Okay, so now what, can, what do we want to do? So we saw this uh, random version of a sort of what looks like some kind of decay. And this is the number of light bulbs, remember, that are switching off or are failing, sorry, at each time step. So the time is on the x-axis, the number is on the y-axis. And uh, so as you go along, fewer and fewer fail, but that's because there are already fewer and fewer light bulbs that could fail because all the other ones have already failed. And so we want to model that, um, you know, and understand what's going on. So the first thing we can do is just literally run the simulation several times, right? So here are two runs of the simulation and what we're seeing, uh, sorry, that's not the right Y label anymore number of uh, sort of light bulbs, which are still alive, right? So number of light bulbs that are alive. So uh, we, it said number of infectious because as I think I mentioned, this also, this process also mentioned, uh, also models what happens if you have N individuals which start off being sick and at each time step, you have a probability to recover. It also models radioactive decay. What happens if you have N nuclei that are radioactive and at each time step, each one has a probability to, to recover, to, to decay, sorry, to decay and become unradioactive and you know, give off some, uh, uh, so, uh, some neutrons or something. Okay, alpha, alpha particles, I guess. So let me just run this simulation over and over again, right? So every time I call this sim simulate recovery, I call it, but simulate, you know, um, so we're running a simulation of a physical system. So we're simulating, you know, this is a stochastic simulation. Uh, so what does simulation means it mean? It means 
that we are sort of reproducing something from the world in a simplified version inside the computer. And so we're, you know, this is like uh, you have each of these represents different factories which have their own set of light bulbs. And you're just running the, you know, you're looking at what happens in each of those factories. And so as I run the simulation again and again, we, we, we see sort of the results from different factories. So now let's put all of those together on one graph. And here, so here we have, um, so each, again, each time I run the simulation, it will give me a different plot. Oh no, it won't. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I have to run this again and again. Uh, that's where I'm generating the data and then I'm here I'm just plotting it. So when I run this again and again, and I plot all those different curves for each different factory, you can see that, well, okay, the, the, the sort of shape is changing and sort of moving around a bit, but roughly it's doing the same thing. And so if you look at this curve, what's the immediate first reaction that you would, you would think of? What, what, do you want, what do you want to do with this data? So once again, probably what you would say is, well, you know, each time I run it, it's sort of doing roughly the same thing. So the first thing I would probably think of is taking a mean again. Right? So if you fix your attention at 25, for example, t equals 25, you could just say, well, what's the average value right there? It's something like here. Then at 50, it's something like here. And you just do that same calculation for each time. And what, what happens is this. So here is the same data again. But now at each time, at each time step, I took the mean of all of the simulations at that time. So this is interesting because this is actually uh, what might be a new concept, which is I have functions, I have like random functions that behave in a certain way. And I'm taking the mean, not of data points, but I'm actually taking the mean of those random functions. If you like. Uh, so how do you take the mean of, two, of some functions? You just add up the functions and divide by the number of functions. This is exactly the same formula. You can even write it in exactly the same way in Julia. Okay, so now if I, if I, well, okay, so the mean is not everything, of course. There's also how much I vary away from the mean. How much is the spread, right, at, for example, again, time 25, it's sort of spread out away from the mean. And I want to know, well, how far away from the mean might I be? And in other, words, in other words, I want some kind of variance or standard deviation of the data at time 25. And again, I could do the same thing all along and I could get the sort of standard deviation as a function of time. Uh, and so, you know, it's basically what we did last time, the same ideas, but now you're doing the same thing at each time step uh, in this stochastic process. Okay. But if we just focus attention on the mean for now, what do we notice about the, this, this function, this the red curve? Well, it actually looks pretty smooth now. Right? So I've kind of averaged out all of the randomness and I get something that actually sort of smooth and doesn't look random at all really. Was, yeah, maybe there's a bit of still a blip here, but basically it looks pretty smooth and non-random. So not something that's non-random or not random is called deterministic. So it looks like maybe there is a way that we could forget about all this randomness and just look at this sort of deterministic thing. Okay, so, and by the way, if we plot it on a semi-log graph, so we take a logarithmic scale in the y direction, we see that basically it's a straight line on that semi-log graph. And that is evidence that maybe this thing is decaying. So you could ask how fast is this decaying? If it's a straight line on a semi-log graph, that means it's decaying exponentially fast. So there's some exponential function, basically the number still functioning at time t is something like e to the minus some constant times t with some other constant multiplying it. So c times exponential of minus lambda t for some lambda. Okay, so can we actually understand that? So we want uh, to study the time evolution of the mean actually, right? So we're at each time, at time t, we want to take the mean and I, uh, have a, an issue with my notation. I thought we fixed that, but uh, apparently not. So this IT is just uh, NT, the total number of uh, light bulbs that are still alive at time T. So in the above graph, the number, uh, the total number that are alive is, in, is green. So we colored that in green here. And the total number that at a given time are failing is in red. So that's what this number is. So how many fail at time T? Well, at time t, 
there are, there are n t, n sub t, which are currently alive. And then each of those fails with probability p. So we would need to know how many fail in total at that time, if there are n alive and each of them fails with probability p. So it's pretty intuitive to think that the mean is actually going to be n times p. So basically you have to add up the means of all of these things and there are n of them, so you get n times p. So once you do that, um, then the change in the total number that are alive is however many are alive now minus however many failed at that moment. And so uh, basically we get this, the new number that are alive is the number that were alive previously minus the number that failed. And so that's nt minus p times nt. And then we get, uh, and so hence we get nt plus one is, so this is, you know, we can factor nt here and we get one minus p times nt or it. I for a number of infected people in the model of recovery. And so now we have what's called a recurrence relation, right? We, we, this tells me the number at the next time step in terms of the number at the current time step and this thing, which is a, a constant. So now we have to solve this to find what nt is at time t, uh, find a formula for that. And so let's do one step. So it plus one is something in terms of it. If I do the same thing again, I get it is one minus p times i t minus one here. And so i t plus one is one minus p squared times n, uh, or i, I'm getting confused, sorry, i t minus one. And if we carry on doing that and unfold all of these things, then we get down to the, the, the t, the at time t, the total number is one minus p to the power t times the number that there were initially. And we've actually solved the whole problem. Uh, and that's the analytical solution. So now let's compare that um, to, uh, let's compare that to the numerics. So here's the numerics is in blue. That's the mean of the stochastic simulations that I did above. And then here's the deterministic model in red, right? So the exact uh, result, the theoretical result that I just derived, which is this exponential decay with this factor. And we see that basically they are one, on, one of them is on top of the other. So we have really got a very satisfactory way of describing how the, how the mean changes in time, evolves in time, just the mean, right? But you could actually do the same thing for the standard deviation and get a, a, a similar formula for the standard deviation or variance. Does this only work for light bulbs? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So um, this is, you know, as I said, a very simple model and we get a very simple result for the deterministic um, approximation. In general, it's sort of, you might be able to write down the equations that describe in time how these quantities are changing, but it's often very difficult or impossible to solve those to get an explicit formula for what happens at time t. But in this particular case, we could do it because the model is so simple. But if you start complicating the model where you have different states and that they can change between and the, the, way, the rate at which they change depends on things uh, that depends on the number that they currently are. It doesn't like, work for light bulbs. It doesn't, it doesn't work for, uh, for example, computer chips. Oh, I see. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Or, or I mean, I don't think it really works for light bulbs either. It's too simple a model. It doesn't work for people getting sick either. Uh, it also does not really work for people getting sick. But does it, it work for anything? This, this is effectively, you know, the, the SIR models that we've all seen modeling the pandemic, uh, that's exactly the, we basically have exactly this uh, assumption on the rate at which people recover. It's exactly this model. And so it, it is too simple, but it still sort of works. For some I, I was expecting you to just answer the simple question, which is, um, yes, it doesn't have, it could be any component at all that has a probability of failure. Oh, I see. Sorry. It doesn't have to be light bulbs. I see what you mean. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we're almost out of time. Let's just finish with. We're actually out of time. We are out of time. Okay. In a micro century. Well, in that case, um, we'll carry on next time. So thanks, everybody. See you uh, then. All right. See everybody next Monday.